The Peak District is a place of majesty, mystery and haunting beauty. A timeless setting offering views unchanged for centuries. I'm teaming up with my brother Tim, a local archivist, to map archive material documenting real life events which would have made the headlines of their day onto this landscape. Exploring the past of the peaks and offering you a peek into the past. As an archivist, you're often given tantalising peaks into the past, transported back in time. An archive document can offer a sudden window onto the past. Every so often you stumble upon a story, a story you unearth, a story you want to tell. On the morning of the 12th of October 1840, three young chimney sweeps set out from Tideswell on a journey across the southerly parts of the peak in search of work. It was a journey that was to have devastating consequences and would change their lives forever. And for one little boy, George Hadfield, it was to be the last journey he would ever take. I've sent Holly to Tideswell Church, the Cathedral of the Peak, to follow in the footsteps of that fateful trip. I'm here at the beautiful church of St John the Baptist in the ancient Derbyshire village of Tideswell looking for clues about a young boy from the village who died here over 170 years ago. I'm about to meet local resident and former church warden Alan Thornton who's going to show me around. So Alan, tell us a bit about this amazing building. How old is the church? Well, the church was built between 1320 and 1398. It was built by the Foljam family, mm. and John Foljam's tomb is at the top end of the church. Also, we've got tombs to uh, Sir Samson Meverell, who was a knight and soldier, and he fought at Agincourt and at Orleans against Joan of Arc. But I'm guessing that George Hadfield, the boy that I'm looking for, wasn't given a grand tomb inside the church. No, he's buried somewhere in the churchyard in an unmarked pauper's grave. So really, he wasn't really remembered at all? No, but we do have a record of the burial from the church registers. So. Oh, OK. So there it is. There's the name I'm looking for, George Hadfield. And it says, age 10 buried on October the 22nd, 1840. But this doesn't really tell me much. I really want to know more about the boy and why he died so young. Well, a death certificate would tell you more, and there's a copy. Okay. George Hadfield, aged nine years, 11 months. So he was actually one month short of his 10th birthday when he died. Occupation is labourer to a chimney sweeper. And oh, here we have cause of death, manslaughter against Luke Clarkson. Now that's interesting. I wonder who this Luke Clarkson is. Well, that's something of a mystery that you all have to solve. Tim's asked me to meet him at a building just across the road from the church called the Old Bull's Head. I'm intrigued, Tim. What is the significance of this place? Why are we meeting here? Right, well, as you can see, this is now a private house. But back in 1840, this was a pub called the Old Bull's Head. Uh, a lot of the original features still remain and this building, indeed this very room, was the crucial setting to discovering the truth about George's death over 170 years ago. Wow, so how was it all connected? Right, well, just take a look at this document. George Hadfield of Tideswell, feloniously killed and slain by Luke Clarkson. Yeah, so the first thing that leaps out at me here is this name, Thomas Mander. Now, he was the coroner mentioned on George's death certificate so this must be a copy of the coroner's report? That's right, and it's very rare for coroner's reports from this early period to survive, so we're really lucky to have this document. Informations of witnesses touching the death of George Hadfield at the house known by the sign of the Bull's Head in Tideswell. 
So this would have been where the coroner's inquest was held. Exactly. Within these very walls, the coroner gathered the witnesses to determine how George died. So for the first time in over 170 years, we're reuniting this document with the very room in which it was produced. And interestingly, this very settle on which we're sat on has recently been dated to precisely 1840, so the coroner may well have heard the witnesses on this very seat. Now, another thing I can't help but notice is this reference, an inquisition on view of the body of the said George Hadfield, there lying dead as follows. Does that mean that George's body was actually examined here where we're sitting? That's right. After the inquest, they wouldn't have had to uh, transfer his body far to be buried, just straight across the road to the churchyard. So, we have a body, but do we have a crime? Sampson Bembridge of Conksbury, labourer, on his oath, saith he was getting potatoes in a field at Conksbury and saw three chimney sweepers. One was a young man, the other two appeared to be boys. Saw the young man kick and punch one of the boys heard the boy cry out. So George was the small boy being beaten by another young man, another chimney sweep? Yes, now other witnesses called to the inquest uh, here said that they also saw George being beaten by another chimney sweep who's later named as Luke Clarkson. There was a butcher from Yorgreave and a gamekeeper from Hartle and they both said that they saw an older chimney sweep laying into a small boy, uh, beating him with a stick and kicking him unmercifully. Why didn't anyone try and stop him? Right, well, the butcher did say that he meant to intervene, but he was too busy grappling with a sheep in the field at the time. Now, we come here to the evidence of the other chimney sweep boy, William Stewart, who was accompanying Luke and George on their journey. William Stewart of Tideswell, aged 12 years, on his oath saith that he has lived with a William Booker, master chimney sweeper of Tideswell, for three years and three quarters, and his mother has lately hired him to William Booker for one shilling a week. Right, so there's an ultimate gang master behind the scenes here, this master chimney sweeper. Yes, so George and William Stewart were both living with William Booker as chimney sweep apprentices. The master did beat us sometimes, but not often. Sometimes we played. We ought not, and the master beat us. Now, here's what William Stewart has to say about Luke Clarkson, the sweep that set about George. Luke Clarkson is a journeyman to my master. He had half what we earn. He beat me sometimes. He thought I was not quick enough. So next, the 12-year-old William Stewart goes into detail about the journey the sweeps took through the peaks that October. We can use this information to retrace their steps and map their movements onto the landscape. First we went to Lytton. Between Lytton and four houses, Luke Clarkson beat the deceased with some nettles. He pulled his britches down and whipped him over the bottom because he could not go fast enough. He also beat him with his brush to Cressbrook. He hit him over the body. And when we got to Cressbrook, he threw him in the river Y. He could not get out, so I went and brought him out. I thought he was drowning. Here's the River Wye as we approach Crestbrook Dale from Lytton. Pretty as a picture on a day like today. But getting thrown in here in October must have been a cruel shock. And if William hadn't have gone in after George, he may well have drowned. I can't help thinking about Charles Kingsley's classic children's story, The Water Babies, where Tom, the little ragamuffin sweep, is abused by the wicked master sweep Grimes. He ends up being chased across a field and then tumbles into a river where he drowns and becomes a water baby. He also beat him all the way to Holmes Public House at the top of the hill with his brush. Now, Holmes Public House was situated here up at Monsell Head, overlooking Monsell Dale. There's a pub here still, and this is one of the best known beauty spots in the peak. The views across the Wye Valley are breathtaking. Shooting across the bottom down there is the iconic 19th century viaduct, now part of the Monsell Trail across the River Wye. But this bridge wouldn't have been built when the chimney sweeps journeyed through this valley back in 1840. What a wild scene it must have been then. 
Just thinking about what happened to George is quite difficult to cope with. Did Luke ever stop laying into the poor little lad? How did George manage to carry on? On Wednesday, we after all went to Albert, and after beating him all the way, Luke locked and put George into the water again. The river Laskill bubbling up crystal clear from a limestone coral reef a few miles upstream cascades through the village of Alport in a series of weirs. There's an old corn mill over there whose giant water wheel would have been grinding away when the chimney sweeps passed in 1840. This could well be the very spot where poor George was tossed into the water by Luke for a second time. It was 12-year-old William Stewart who bravely rescued him, risking the wrath of Luke himself. It's such an idyllic spot, hard to imagine such cruelty taking place here. We then went to your grave and stayed there all night, and then went to Calling Row. As we went on the first day to Mr. Bloor's, in a field about three quarters of a mile from the house, George fell down in consequence of a violent push which Luke Clarkson gave him on the back of the head. George fell upon a heap of stones. Some women came and then saw a lump over his eye and desired he might go to Mr. Bloor's. This is where George's little broken body finally gave way and he was felled for the last time. That gruelling trip around the peaks must have been such a terrible ordeal for little George. The only comfort I get is knowing that he was offered shelter and was well looked after here at this farm in his final few days. According to these inquest papers, the farmer, William Bloor, and his sister tried to give George food and drink and made up a bed of straw for him in these stables. Luke tried to explain away George's injuries by saying that he was drunk on a pint of ale someone had given him. The farmer actually allowed all three chimney sweeps to stay overnight in these stables to allow George to recover. After days of being relentlessly beaten, George finally found sanctuary here in these stables and received care from the farming family who lived here. But was it too little, too late? The following morning, George was still in a bad way and couldn't continue the journey with the others. So Luke said that he and the other chimney sweep boy, William Stewart, would head off to the nearby village of Moniash to seek work and would return here to Calling Low later that day to collect George. But Luke never returned. The inquest papers show that George spent two nights at Corlinglay Farm and then Farmer Bloor sent him back to his mum's in Tideswell by horse and cart, where we know that the Bakewell Paul or Union surgeon, Methaloosa Moore, was called out to tend to George, but to no avail, for he died just two days later. Moore's post-mortem records that he died of injuries which were produced by violence upon the head of the deceased. So George died at home in Tideswell aged just nine, but there are still so many unanswered questions. Why did George's mother not give evidence at the inquest? Where was George's father? What happened to Luke Clarkson? George's fate appears to have attracted interest from some notable figures at the time. I found the coroner's report into his death amongst some papers of James Montgomery, the celebrated 19th century Scottish-born poet, hymn writer and Sheffield newspaper editor. Now Montgomery was a passionate campaigner for humanitarian causes such as ending the exploitation of child chimney sweeps. In fact he became known as the champion of the chimney sweeps, hence his apparent interest in this case which I'm sure he would have used in his campaign. I've got here an interesting letter written to Montgomery from the secretary of the Society for Doing Away with the Use of Children in Sweeping Chimneys about a new bill they were trying to push through Parliament abolishing this practice of sending kids up chimneys. Now it was written just one year before George died. It wasn't for another 35 years in 1875 before this awful practice of sending kids up chimneys was finally abolished. 
I've just heard from Tim and he's made an exciting discovery which sheds further light on the death of George and provides answers to some of the things that we've been puzzling over. In particular, he's found some information on what happened to Luke Clarkson after he abandoned George at Calling Low Farm. So I'm off to the archives to find out more. I came across this. It's the actual prosecution papers for the trial of Luke Clarkson. We find out George was the illegitimate son of a Betty Hadfield who's described as an idiot. The implication is she had learning difficulties and with no husband to support her, it would have been down to George to go out to work as a chimney sweep at nine years old to keep his mum out of the workhouse. Okay, now can we find out what happened to Luke Clarkson? So Luke cunningly manages to convince William Stewart to go away on the run with him by sort of telling him that he too could get blamed for what happened to George. 50 miles from Tideswell, William starts to get cold feet and thinks about going back home. So this is William's testimony. William, will you go with me to Stamford? What must I go with you for? Why are you as bad as myself? I have done nothing at the boy, have I? That does not mean they will not think of you as bad as myself. If you go and stop with me, I'll give you a new suit of clothes. Luke, have I done anything at the boy? No. Well then, it will be my best way to go back again. And then finally, at the end, the prisoner offered to give him three-fourths of their earnings if he would stop with him, but he refused, and the prisoner cried, and took Witness's climbing cap off his head and kept it. What are they there? Were they tears of rage or frustration or maybe panic? What might he have done next? Yeah, well, Luke knew that William was the key witness against him. I think you're right. The 12-year-old could have been a serious danger here. He needed a quick getaway, but he's got 50 miles to cover to get back to Tideswell on very tired feet, alone through the night. Whilst William returned to Tideswell, the prosecution papers show that Luke continued on the run to Northamptonshire where he was pursued by the authorities and arrested about a month later, almost 100 miles from the scene of the crime. From there, he was transferred to Derby Jail to await trial. But these papers don't actually tell us what happened to Luke after his imprisonment. So I'm heading off to Derby Jail, which is now a working museum, to meet the owner, historian Richard Felix, in the hope that I'll discover what happened to Luke when he was in there. Richard, thank you very much for agreeing to show me around today. Pleasure. So, what would have conditions been like here in the 1800s? Oh, pretty rough in a place like this. Um, I mean, you'd be in this cell for probably 23 hours a day. Um, there were no toilets in, in, in the place in those days. Um, there would have been a bucket, straw on the floor. I mean, you had a bed, but I mean, uh, you were let out for one hour's exercise and that was about it. Um, jail fever was still rife in those days. The walls, as you can see, were lime washed to try and kill the bugs uh, and they were scraped every six months um, but people would have, would have died of, of jail fever in this place and some of them probably gone bonkers as well being shut in here for 23 hours a day alone can't imagine it terrible conditions would prisoners have been executed for their crimes whilst they were kept here well very much so yeah yeah this was the county jail so any, any crime committed in Derbyshire you ended up here and of course this would have been at the back of Luke's mind all the time. Mm. Um, he, he'd taken a life and that was punishable by his own life being taken. And we can't help but notice it's a little bit spooky down here. Do you think it's perhaps haunted by some of the ghosts of prisoners past? We know for a fact that it's haunted by a guy called Dick Thorley. And he was the last person to be publicly executed uh, in 1862. He was hanged by William Calcraft, the longest serving hangman in British history. Uh, and Thorley's ghost still wanders uh, inside the jail area and actually walks through the door into the drop room. This is where you came up, the hangman was waiting for you. You stepped through that doorway out onto the gallows. This is a hangman's rope. This was used by Samuel Haywood, executioner for Derbyshire. This was used in 1847, it was his last hanging. That's why it's still preserved. But they didn't have a new rope every time. Uh, he hanged three huge men in 1843. He'd been hanging people from 1817. So in other words, if Luke had been hanged, uh, there's every possibility that that's the rope that he would have used. But this strangled people to death. Yeah. Taking anything up to quarter of an hour to die. Get 
the, the fascinating thing is that these are all um, like sentences of the prisoners. Can you imagine if he's, he's on one of these, 1840, 1842, 1840, 1841? Yeah. <laughs> that was the year. Uh... Luke Clarkson. <laughs> Luke Clarkson, this is him, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, age, Luke Clarkson, age 19, charged upon the coroner's warrant with feloniously killing and slaying George Hadfield at Tideswell, committed 22nd of October 1840 by T-Manda, gent, coroner, transported 15 years. <laughs> what about that? Wow! After finding out that Luke was spared the hangman's rope but sentenced to 15 years transportation instead, I'm hoping to find out more about what led to this sentence. So I've come to Sheffield Local Studies Library in the hope that local newspapers at the time reported on the trial. Now I know that the trial was held in March 1841. So here we go, horrible cruelty to a sweep. It looks like we might have found something here. Derby Assizes, March 18th. Luke Clarkson, aged 19, charged upon the coroner's warrant with feloniously killing and slaying George Hadfield at Tideswell. William Stewart, a boy about 13 years old, who gave his evidence in such a way as to carry the conviction of truth with it, disposed as follows. So it looks like at the trial, William Stewart, the other apprentice boy, gives the same kind of evidence he did to the coroner, but with some awful extra details. Before we reached Alport, he whipped him with nettles until blood came. So we get these details of William trying to stick up for George. The deceased was a little boy, only nine years old. He trotted on all day as well as he could and was tired. He was not obstinate. He did not refuse to go on. He could not walk so fast as we could. I asked the prisoner once to let him alone and he said if I asked him again, he would serve me the same. The prisoner, who had a very objectionable countenance, put the boy through a long cross-examination with a view to show that he had treated the deceased kindly and that it was the witness, William, himself, who ill-treated him. But the boy's straightforward answers completely overturned the subtlety of the prisoner. We never recollect hearing a better witness in a court of justice. That's shocking, so Luke was trying to pin the blame on William in court, but this report is full of praise about the way William Stewart stood up to Luke and testified against him. Prisoner, have you anything to say in your defence? I'm sorry, but I assure you, I'm as innocent as the child unborn. The learned judge then summed up, and the jury returned a verdict of guilty. Sentenced to 15 years transportation, the prisoner betrayed no signs of surprise or regret. I've been looking through some criminal registers held at the National Archives in London. It's for a convict ship, the Justitia, which was moored at Woolwich on the River Thames. And here is Luke Clarkson, age 19. His crime is manslaughter. Convicted at Derby, 15th of March, 1841. Sentence, 15 years transportation. His trade is sweep, as in chimney sweep. Mm. And have a look here at the jailer's report. Very bad character. Even the jailer noticed Luke's personality. I think that's really quite telling. Yeah, exactly. And this final column, how disposed of VDL on 13th of May, 1841. VDL? Now that's Van Diemen's land. It's what we now know as Tasmania, Ireland off the south coast of Australia. So I've got here a um, extract from the Australia convict muster roll from 1841 and it lists the convicts and what happened to them when they arrived in Tasmania. So here we have the entry for Luke Clarkson. He sailed in on the Westmoreland and he was sent to the Bridgewater party. So that was the name of his particular penal colony. I've come to Sheffield Hallam University to meet history lecturer Dr Anthony Taylor. Now, Luke Clarkson, the convict that I'm interested in, was sent to Tasmania on a convict ship called the Westmoreland in 1841. What would that journey have been like? Well, it, it, it can vary very, very dramatically. In, in the early days of transportation, when it's an experiment, conditions on the first and second fleet are, are very poor. And on the second fleet, something between a third and a quarter of all convicts die on the journey. By the 1840s, it's better but the people who are transported are still confined below decks, they still have very little natural light, they're still drinking water that was taken up from the Thames, 
really and taken on the journey with them. On arrival, Luke was sent to a penal colony called the Bridgewater Party. What sort of work would he have been doing there? The Bridgewater Party would have been uh, an outlying station of Port Arthur outside Hobart. Uh, and essentially, criminals who were sent there worked on the road to create an infrastructure for the colony, building bridges, uh, building roads, uh, surfacing the road. It was hard physical labour. We have a representation of a criminal party here, and you'll see they're heavily shackled. Yeah, it would have been really gruelling punishment for Luke. How would he have coped with that? Well, we, we have here his, his conduct record from Tasmania, uh, and it, it's clear that it, it's quite a, a full record of what happened to him in, in Tasmania. Yeah, so uh, this is a conduct record that explains exactly how he behaved over there. Yes, I mean, we, we have here details of, of persistent reoffending, uh, and, and we have here details of petty theft, petty, petty larceny would have been called. This is really interesting. It says all about describes him really well, his height, face shape, oval, mm. face much pockpitted. So what does this bit here mean where it mentions 36 stripes? Uh, this is essentially a, a reference to a flogging and it's actually you'll be whipped in, in multiples of 12 basically uh, and it's more than simply being whipped with a whip. Uh, the whips involved have been specially strengthened in vinegar they have brass inlays and they're, they're bound around with barbed wire. So they essentially take the, the skin off your back. It's, it's kind of flaying in effect. The last record we, we have of him is effectively uh, cattle rustling in, in 1874 after the penal system has been dismantled. And this is 30 years after Luke was first sent to Tasmania. It seems that he just can't reform. He can't leave his life of crime behind him. Yes, we, we might, might call him an incorrigible, actually, an incorrigible rogue. One of the things we learnt from the court papers was that Luke wasn't a local lad but came from well outside the area, the village of Alwalton in Huntingdonshire, some 100 miles away. I've come back to Tideswell to meet Tim to find out more about Luke's background. Tim's been doing some research down at Huntingdonshire Archives and has made some interesting discoveries. OK, so I've got a couple of documents here to show you. So here we have Luke's baptism at Alwalton Church in January 1823. OK, so we have Luke, son of John and Mary Clarkson from Alwalton, father's job labourer. So that sounds like a normal enough background. Well, it does, but have a look here at this document relating to the birth of Luke's younger brother, Hodson, in 1827. It's a affiliation order or bastardy bond, and this document was, uh, was drawn up to identify the father of an illegitimate child. It's got some interesting details about the whereabouts of Luke's dad at this point in time. The examination of Mary Clarkson, wife of John Clarkson, under sentence of transportation for his life. So like Luke, his dad was transported to the other side of the world. Do we know what for? Well, it appears that John Clarkson was a notorious thief in the area. Have a look at this document here. It's a newspaper report from December 1823 and there's an interesting description of John Clarkson. John Clarkson, late of Al Walton, a collector of old brass, rags, rabbit skins, etc. Well known by the name of Civil Will and who has already been transported, the said John Clarkson, who appears to be about 42 years of age, yet walks with a crutch and a stick, is also charged with being concerned in several other robberies in this neighbourhood. Yeah, it's clear that Luke wouldn't have seen much of his dad growing up. So I imagine that for Luke and the rest of the family, things must have been pretty difficult. Yeah, the Al Walton overseers of the poor records reveal that Mary Clarkson, Luke's mum and her children were living in pretty wretched poverty. Hence why the overseers ended up apprenticing Luke to Tideswell here as a child chimney sweep at a very young age. We know that he did come back to Huntingdonshire because we've got this document here. So this is a list of prisoners in Huntington Jail? Yes, including a name down here you should recognise. So we have Luke Clarkson charged with highway robbery. Luke became a thief like his dad. Yes, and have a look here at his sentence. Three calendar months hard labour and twice privately whipped. And look at this date here, the 30th of December 1839. So this would have been less than a year before Luke ended up killing George after he was whipping him with nettles and sticks. Yeah, so I think this sentence could be quite significant in the light of what we know happened to George. And we're able to build up a pretty big picture about Luke's background and what a sorry background that was. 
From various scraps of historical sources, it's been possible to piece together this true tale of a chimney sweep boy's life. The story imprints itself forever on this limestone landscape. So many of the buildings still stand. Callinglow Farm, which sheltered George in his last days. The Bull's Head Pub in Tideswell, which held the inquest into his death. Derby Jail, where Luke Clarkson languished before trial and transportation, and the final resting place of George in a quiet corner of a Peakland churchyard. For Luke Clarkson, what began as a 20-mile trek around the Derbyshire Peak took him eventually to Tasmania, to the other side of the world. But maybe he was a victim too, in a way. At just 19, having served a tough child apprenticeship to a chimney sweep master, forced to live far away from his family for much of his life and with a hardened criminal for a father. When young William Stewart announced on the run that he was going to desert Luke and return to Tideswell, Luke began to cry. Does this show another side to him? Fear, fragility, regret perhaps? Luke died in Tasmania in May 1883 at the Newtown Charitable Institute for the Destitute and the Infirm. He was in his early 60s. He left this world in the same state in which he'd entered it, in abject poverty, but he died a free man. William Stewart emerges as a real little hero in this piece. He rescued George twice from drowning. He stood up to Luke's bribing, blackmailing and intimidation. He played a key role in securing Luke's conviction. Shortly after George's death, William left Tideswell for Stockport, where we've learnt his mum lived. His new life in Stockport remains a mystery as he disappears from the records. It would be nice to think that he escaped from the hardship of the life of a chimney sweep apprentice and returned to the comfort of his mother's arms. And as for George Hadfield, he ended up here at Tideswell Church, where he lies in illustrious company alongside knights and bishops who served at the right hand of kings. But in a way, George's life, which isn't told on a grand tomb or in a textbook, is perhaps more remarkable than that of any knight. He may not have fought for his country at Agincourt, but he battled a way to keep his pauper mother out of the workhouse, working as a poor chimney sweep boy, sacrificing first his childhood and ultimately his life. As his friend William simply put, he trotted along as best he could until his fragile little body finally gave way and he fell in the corner of a farmer's field. I think that makes him of equal worth to any knight. I think it was Baudelaire who said about the heroism of everyday life, never was that more true of George. I'm thankful having had the opportunity to share the story of this brave little boy and I hope that in this glorious spot, after all he suffered, he finally found peace.